morning and welcome to Union Center Church of the Brethren here in this place and from wherever you are. Would you join me in our responsive candle lighting? When we set out on our journey of faith, there are many real barriers in our path. Our first candle is lit because of those real barriers to discipleship in our world. However, before we even start on this path, we may find it difficult to begin because of the imaginary barriers we create. Our fears can craft impassable barriers, which, though they don't exist, may impede us on our journey of faith. This candle is lit to dispel the darkness so that we may see clearly what is real and what is an illusion. Guide us on your path that we may rise your kingdom, sharing the one truth of your love. Our final candle is lit to provide us courage in these present dark times. We have already taken the first steps in this new journey. You have blessed us with companions in our faith that we may lean on each other, learn from each other, and love each other along the way. And also join me in our responsive morning psalm. The Lord is king, robed in majesty, robed and girded with strength. God has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, more majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. 
And now for a song of praise and worship.
Well, this is the time when I invite my friends to come forward for the children's story. This is one of my favorite books because there's a lot more to the pictures as we get a look at them. Uh, but it's a familiar Bible passage. It says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And we see here the first one, a time to be born. And we can see uh, you know, that there's, there's a family that's growing, uh, and, but there's a little house here where think grandpa and grandma live and then it says a time to be born a time to die and kind of sad looking maybe somebody's missing now in the family a time to plant we can see everybody in the family involved in getting things ready and a time to pluck up that which is planted and you know we see everybody helping to gather the crops and also a few animals getting some of the corn and getting some of the things that are growing. A time to kill. We see out in the fishing boat, they're getting fish for our dinner. And a time to heal. And I don't know if you can see, but this cow must have broken her leg because she's got a wrapping around it and they're helping her get better. A time to break down. Well... I think the house where Grandpa and Grandma lived, they're kind of taking down some of the stuff and a time to build up. And now they're working because there's going to be a nice young family living there. People are growing up and having families of their own. A time to weep. Somebody let go of their kite and it's flying away, but there's somebody standing there with a little red bag watching. You can almost not see it. And a time to laugh. So if we have a time to weep, we see they've turned that red bag into a kite. So there's a way of turning sad things into happy things. A time to mourn. We're having a sad funeral. And a time to dance. You know, when we remember people and how wonderful they were, sometimes we cry and then we laugh. And we share kind of a little party. A time to cast away stones, and I think this boy is using his slingshot to knock over cans. And a time to gather stones together. Well, now they have making pictures with stones instead of using them to knock over the cans, kind of making a boat there. Looks like it's in the water. A time to embrace. Everybody is hugging. They're glad to see. And a time to refrain from embracing. Every hello sometimes comes with a goodbye. A time to get. And here comes somebody with some new stuff that they need. And a time to lose. He was trading some of those goods in order to get a calf. And I think the kids are a little sorry that the calf is leaving. A time to keep. We see kids playing together. And a time to cast away. I think one kid is giving another a doll there to, to share, so they're giving away something. A time to rend, that means tearing. You can see somebody tearing some cloth. And a time to sew. And this beautiful blue cloth, I don't know what it was before, but now it's a dress. A time to keep silence. Sometimes it's okay to be quiet. And a time to speak. Looks like somebody is putting on a little play or maybe reciting something. People are calling out to the kids. They're working in the field. A time to love. The family's looking at the moon and enjoying it. And that time to hate. I think that boy 
had his slingshot working again, so these two kids are telling him to stop. A time of war, and we see all these grave markers, and a time of peace. And we see the rainbow, which is a promise of God's peace. And everybody in the whole family, the young and the old and all the animals and the crops are together. These words are right from the Bible. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. I like this book because it reminds us that our life is filled with a lot of ups and downs and it's normal. And the Bible tells us these things happen to all of us in their time. Thank you for listening to my book here. I appreciate it. Yeah. God bless you. And, uh, and if you want to borrow this, you're welcome to. Yeah. Here, if you would take it to the back for me, at least that would help. Otherwise, I'll knock it over when I'm up there. What's the most money you've ever found lying out on the road? Spare change, a 10 or 20, some serious cash? Take a moment to think about what you found as well as if and how you went about restoring it to its proper owner. And if that was not possible, what you chose to spend it on. Finding others' cash in our hands is a rare experience for most of us. But for those working in banking, credit unions, trust funds, and other financial organizations, it's an everyday occurrence to have, passing through their hands, incredible amounts of cash. The whole process requires tremendous trust on everyone's part. The people handling the money, from the newest teller to the officer with the long longest tenure, handles tremendous amounts of cash, physically and electronically, every single day. Not only that, but as for most of us, most, much of the cash they shepherd is not actually in the building. It's out in the world doing hard work, fulfilling dreams, making lives better, building, creating, and of course growing. That's a tremendous responsibility as well. Everyone working in the industry is a real person with problems both personal and financial so they are not working in a vacuum. Yes, we do hear about financial misdealings on occasion, but one of the reasons this is news is because it happens relatively rarely. So let us this week give thanks for the hard work and trust of everyone involved in the financial industry. Let us pray together to bless us all in this monument of trust and faith that is our economic system. Would you join me in a unison prayer? Lord Jesus, you have told us that those who are faithful in little will be faithful also in much. We praise you for the faithfulness we find in the financial ties that bind us together. We pray you will not lead us into temptation when it comes to financial dealings, but instead will strengthen us all, including our sisters and brothers in the various branches of the financial institutions that keep us bound together as one people. We recognize how you are revealed in the transactions we share in banking institutions and pray you will strengthen and support everyone near and far who work together faithfully with great and small amounts of money. Bless us in the knowledge that there is nothing evil in money but in the love of money. And may we find in every transaction one more reason to praise you. This we pray in your name. Amen.
Today we give thanks to God for all we have received, blessings given freely, graciously, and with love. As we contribute to our shared ministry in the name of Jesus Christ, let us em emulate our creator, giving freely, graciously, and with love. Would you join me in our unison prayer for our offering? We thank, we thank you, you, Lord, now and always, for the opportunity to share in your great plan of salvation. May we continue with you to draw out shalom from conflict, hope out of despair, and abundance in the midst of want. Bless our offerings, God of giving, as we place ourselves in your hands, trusting in your Holy Spirit to guide us as we seek to serve our community, our nation, and our world. Amen. I will be reading from Judges chapter 7 this morning. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Purah, and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Purah, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. Most of us would say we're not superstitious, but, but we probably have little rituals that we like to do just to be on the safe side, you know, doing things in a certain order and uh, all that. I know that uh, uh, actors have superstitions, and they're just out and out blatant about it, things, things that they have to do in a certain order before they go out and perform or things that you're not ever supposed to do. One of the most famous is that you're never supposed to say the name of this one play that Shakespeare wrote. It's Macbeth. You're supposed to say the Scottish play because it's supposed to be very unlucky. I know it's not true, but uh, once when I was in the play I Hate Hamlet uh, over at the Elkhart Civic Theater back in the 90s, uh, it's a play about John Barrymore, the actor, coming back from the dead to teach a TV actor uh, how, how to play Hamlet and Shakespeare in the park. And it was very funny, and it was the last time I had enough hair to have a ponytail in the back since I played the L.A. producer that was trying to talk this actor out of doing Shakespeare and coming back to L.A. But anyway, uh, uh, we were rehearsing, and there was a break, and somebody brought up Macbeth, and another person said, you can't say Macbeth, you have to say the Scottish play. And uh, the one woman thought that was ridiculous, and she said, Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. And at that moment, a securely tied sandbag that was hanging up high in the rafters somehow came loose and dropped with a thud right next to us. I'm still not superstitious about that, but that was an uncomfortable coincidence turns out. You know, uh, I was listening, what brought that incident back to mind was a few weeks ago I was listening to a podcast, the, the Folger Shakespeare podcast, which I'm sure all of you are signed up for too. 
and Greg Duran, who had been directing at the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, for over 45 years and had just retired, was mentioning that before he began directing Macbeth, and he had all these professional actors around him, he made them jump out of his chair by saying, Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. And fortunately, in his case, nothing happened. He just wanted to get that out of the way so people would stop walking on eggshells but, and get down to the business. Sometimes, you know, we have to confront those fears. And a lot of times, no sandbag drops out of the rafters to fall right near us. We defeat ourselves before we get started. Now, I know that most of you open your devotionals by turning to the book of Judges just about every morning and can quote different parts of it. And actually, I know you don't because one time uh, my friend Bob Neff and I decided we wanted to write a People of the Covenant book about Judges because nobody writes about Judges. But, but there's kind of a, a basic cycle that takes place in the book. The people forget about God, so God takes a step back they are given over to their enemies. They cry out in oppression. God sends a judge, a prophet sort of called out of nowhere. That judge leads them against great odds to victory. The people give thanks to God. And then, as often happens, when, when things are going good, we forget about God, and the cycle starts over and over. Gideon... The hero of this particular cycle, I remember, because as a kid, I never could get the lesson. I thought we weren't supposed to test God, but, but when Gideon is told by the angel of the Lord that he is to lead his people out of oppression, and he is the runt of the litter in a large family, in a family that is part of the smallest tribe and the least influence, he asks for a sign. And I never get the order right, and if you get it right, that's fine. But I know one of the signs is he's going to leave a fleece out, and it's going to be soaked with dew, and everything else is going to be dry. And then when that isn't good enough, he's going to leave a fleece out, and everything's going to be soaked with dew, but the fleece is going to be dry and everything else wet, or vice versa. I, I can't keep the order straight. But it struck me as odd as a kid that you could get away with testing God. And what I love about the Scriptures is... There's always something that contradicts something that was already there because God is too busy trying to love us and, and, and walk with us than to worry about a foolish consistency. And uh, I might remind you the quote that's, that's attributed to uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's not known if he actually said it, but he's supposed to have said, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. So he's not consistent. God doesn't worry about consistency. But there are a number of things that happen to overcome these fears. Once Gideon decides he will lead God's people against the oppressors, there are 32,000 who are willing to follow him. But God says, tell the ones that are shaking in their boots to go home. And Gideon makes that offer. And 22,000 leave. That's a whole bunch. I mean, that doesn't sound like good management. He's down to 10,000. And then God says, and here's once again where I might get the order wrong. Tell them all to get a drink at the river. And uh, the ones that get down on hands and knees and, and just lap the water up, you're going to send home. And the ones that bring the water to their lips, you're going to keep. And that's, they go from 10,000 to 300. And having looked at a number of commentaries on judges, there's no agreement as to why that's such a good thing. But there's only 300. And as you saw in the scripture that Tina read, the Midianites and the Amalekites, and I like the way you pronounce that. You were not afraid at all. And there will not be a test. Midianites, Amalekites. But, but anyway, when they, when they come to the camp, you know, God says, I want you to go there at night and attack right now. You know, this is, this is just like George Washington crossing the Delaware on Christmas Eve, going when they don't expect it. But, but just in case you're afraid, sneak into the camp and listen. 
And so he is afraid. He sneaks into the camp. He sees the Midianites and the Amalekites like locusts. And I believe there is a western state right now which is being overrun by insects again in one of those old-fashioned uh, blanketings that we sometimes see. And not only that, but the camels are like the sands in the sea. I mean, they've got so, that means they have tons of supplies. But what happens? He hears somebody telling their dream. And you and I know dreams a lot of times don't mean anything. They're just silly. And he imagines a round loaf of barley bread, which is kind of like a giant tortilla. The dream is about a giant tortilla rolling into camp and collapsing a tent. Now, a lot of us would think this is the good beginning to a movie. But it's too late for you to write cocaine bear. It's already been done. <laughs> All right? But either way, giant tortilla rolls into camp, collapses a tent, and what, you know, Somebody else speaks up. Most of us would say, I think you had too many tortillas for dinner last night, you know, and maybe a couple of margaritas. Of course, not you, your brethren. But um, so, yeah, you put it in a shaker or a thermos or something. But either way, that we, most of us would dismiss a dream like that. But we've got a grump there. We've got a guy who is already defeated. We've got somebody who always goes to the shady side of the street. Somebody who sees the worst in everything and knows why it can't be done. And he says, he says, your dream about the giant tortilla collapsing a tent means that Gideon is going to defeat us. Sometimes when we've talked ourselves into defeat, we don't realize that the forces that we fight against or are arrayed against us are even more defeatist. Sometimes we are giving ourselves every excuse for failure when there's every reason to think with a little stiffer spine we can change the world. We can make a difference. We can run a great vacation Bible school like we just did. We can have a great love feast like we did after, after going without communion for almost two years and just seeing people's eyes moisten because we were coming together again in love. When great tasks face us, it doesn't matter how small we are or how much we struggle. If we're ready, if we don't interpret the giant tortilla to mean that we're toast, and remember, tortillas and toast are two different things, even though they both begin with T. That's probably the only thing you'll remember from this sermon, right? But at any rate, as it turns out, Gideon leads his army that was 32,000, that is now just 300, and their weapons are torches, great lights upon the hillside, trumpets making a loud noise, and jars that they smash. So they make a tremendous fuss and bother, and it is that which allows them to defeat the army that is arrayed like locusts with the camels that are like grains of sand upon the shore with their scant few. It's easy for me to get discouraged, but it's very hard for me to misinterpret a dream and see defeat right away. Generally, if we just give ourselves a chance to catch up on our sleep and pat a dog and take a deep breath and notice that despite our mini drought, the corn was more than knee-high by the 4th of July, we know we can do this thing. And what amazes me about this congregation and about our Christian faith around the world is despite all the barriers that are put up against us, despite all the people that misrepresent themselves as Christians that only want to talk about hate and about a God who hates, 
But somehow, the love of Jesus Christ, who died for us so that we might be empowered to change ourselves and the world, come about. If you start off by looking at your silly dreams and thinking that you're defeated, you are. But if you shake off those feelings of defeat and discouragement that we all have, and they are very real, and sometimes they are well-merited because we have struggled, we recognize that the victory ultimately is ours, and we will start, and we do start, to experience it at this time. <sighs> it's important to say Macbeth three times just to get it out of everybody's system and just get started rehearsing. And it's important to listen to somebody's dream, share a good laugh, and say, now we are awake and ready for God's good work in God's good world because we are the people of victory. We are the people whose victory was won on the cross and now... Mostly we're around to gather around and go forward in faith in a difficult and terrifying world knowing that all will be well and all manner of things shall be well. Amen. All right. We're about to share the ordinance of communion. Uh, we were, this past week I've been at annual conference, and you share a lot of things and you hear a lot of things, and I, I, a friend of mine who's often in ecumenical settings, we were discussing how the Methodists think they've invented all the things that we brethren really have, like Heffernor National Crop, Church World Service, and a number of stuff. They actually were started by us. And uh, that led to some, because we love Methodists, but that led to uh, uh, somebody else saying, you know, a friend of mine was saying, John Wesley, who's kind of the founder of the Methodist movement, had communion every morning because he thought it was so special he needed to have it every day. And so I said, and we brethren think communion is so special. We only have it two or four times a year. And there is something special about something we can't share all the time. I alluded in my message about how much we missed communion, something as simple as communion because of the pandemic, so on that Christmas Eve, when we had a drive-up communion, all of our deacons wearing gloves and masks, and it was freezing outside, and people would roll their window down, and we'd read a scripture muffled by a mask, and then they'd drive up and receive the elements, and that people were, were, were crying. They were so happy just to have any symbol that the ties that bind us together in love are not defeated by something like a disease that passes. And so today we are going to celebrate communion, and uh, you will be invited to come forward and, and to take bread and a little cup. And uh, you will also, uh, if you're not comfortable moving on up, just raise your hands. We have some deacons ready to take it to you. Uh, so I just want to remind you of the words the Apostle Paul shared in the first letter to the Corinthians, saying, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it, they drank it, and he said, This cup is the covenant of my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, we share your love with each other. 
We share your love with all who worship with us on Facebook and YouTube and virtually. We are blessed that in breaking the bread in all circumstances in our life, something so extraordinary is happening that we can give you thanks and praise. Blessed be the ties that bind us together in you. In these things we pray in your mighty name. Amen. I'd like to invite our deacons to come forward at this time who are helping with uh, communion. And we've, our head deacon here, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes, I would like to add that during this time of our sharing of communion, uh, for those who watch this later, uh, you will see a set of words. I would ask you to uh, reflect on those words and to reflect on your faith walk, however that may be, and to recommit to that journey.
Help us to interpret the signs of the time that we may see hope, seek peace, and love abundantly in your name. Amen.